Hi, my name is Amanda Campbell Crawford, and I'm the current chair for the Michigan Freedom Trail Commission. We want to welcome you to our fourth annual Heritage Gathering and ask that you celebrate with us in Michigan's Underground Railroad Month here in September. The Michigan Freedom Trail Commission was founded in 1998 with the intense mission, mission and purpose to promote, preserve, interpret, understand, and educate on Michigan's unique role in the Underground Railroad. The Underground Railroad is one of history's greatest examples of the pursuit of civil rights, a conversation that even 174 years later is still very relevant today. We ask that you ask questions, lean in, learn, and most of all, we hope that you share what you hear here today. If you have questions or comments or feedback for us, or you're interested in the Michigan Freedom Trail Commission, we hope that you reach out. Thanks for joining us. Hello. I'm Sandra Clark, director of the Michigan History Center. And on behalf of our parent agency, the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, I'm pleased to welcome you today to the fourth annual Underground Railroad Heritage Gathering. One of the silver linings of the past few months has been seeing the ability of virtual programming to reach more people and bring in different speakers from across the country. This year, our Freedom Trail Commission Conference Committee, Dr. Roy Finkenbein, Dr. Angela Dillard, and Dr. Jason Young, have put together an exceptional program for all of us to examine Michigan's 1847 support of freedom seekers and the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act. But our embracing of virtual programming does not mean that we have forgotten how valuable in-person sharing of knowledge and experiences is. So we hope that all of you who can will join us on October 2nd in Ann Arbor at the Clements Library to share even more about the work being done in Michigan today and to discover that wonderful library's collections. As always, special thanks to all of you who give your time and effort to tell Michigan's exceptional inspiring stories of resistance to slavery. Hello, I'm Paul Erickson, the director of the William L. Clements Library at the University of Michigan. On behalf of all of my colleagues here at the Clements, I want to say what an honor it is to help co-host the fourth annual Heritage Gathering of the Michigan Freedom Trail Commission. We're looking forward to seeing all of you here in Ann Arbor. The mission of the Clements Library is to collect, preserve, and share the printed and written record of America's diverse histories up to 1900. Our collections of rare books, prints, maps, and manuscripts have particular strengths in the history of exploration, the American Revolution, and 19th century reform, including abolitionism and the work of the Underground Railroad. Situated right at the heart of campus, the Clements is the finest collection of early Americana at a public university in the United States. And that public university part makes a big difference. Our collections exist to be used in teaching and research by students and faculty at the university, scholars around the country, and also by the people of Michigan. If this year's Heritage Gathering is your first visit to the Clements, welcome. We hope you come back again to explore the library's collections. Thank you. Wonderful. Good evening. My name is Angela Dillard. And uh, on behalf of uh, the other uh, Freedom Trail commissioners and uh, people responsible for uh, this program, it's my pleasure to welcome you as well. Tonight's program is the first of uh, several online this month. Um, and this one will introduce and provide background to the four Michigan slave rescues in 1847 that grabbed national attention um, and, and angered slaveholders and their political allies in the Upper South. Kentucky and Missouri slaveholders have become increasingly concerned about freedom seekers fleeing to Michigan and decided to take action by going there and reclaiming their human property. And so we've been thinking a lot about this interstate connection between Kentucky and Michigan and are really delighted to be um, you know, in collaboration with our, uh, our friends in, in Kentucky to bring you this program this evening. Um, so it's my pleasure to, to kind of tell you a little bit about the run of show, what we're going to do, introduce some of this evening's participants. Um, we're going to start with some framing remarks by um, uh, Dayanda Johnson. And let me tell you a little bit about her. She's a historian with the National Park Service, um, who since 2010 
has served in the Midwest Regional Man has served as the Midwest Regional Manager for the National Underground Railroad Freedom Program. In this capacity, she works with local, state, and federal entities, as well as other interested parties to preserve, promote, and educate the public about the history of the Underground Railroad. Um, one of the nation's earliest civil rights movements. Prior to joining the agency, she served as the coordinator for the African American Research and Service Institute at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. Uh, she's a California native. We won't hold that against her. She received her BA in anthropology with a minor in history, yay, um, from the University of California, San Diego. Her MA and PhD is in American Studies from the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. Directly following her, um, we'll have a presentation by Hillary Delaney. Hillary serves as a lead researcher for the African Americans in Boone County History Initiative at the Boone County Public Library. She began researching Boone County's largely unknown Underground Railroad history in 2013 and has expanded her scope to the Northern Kentucky region, free states and Canada. Currently, she has documented over 120 Underground Railroad incidents and genealogical data of 3,000 individuals once enslaved in Boone County. Projects developed from this work include the Underground Railroad and Boone County Bus Tour, um, which is a National Park Service Network to Freedom program, historic roadside markers in Indiana and Kentucky, uh, African American Cemetery documentation in Boone County, the African Americans in Kentucky Borderlands Database, and the Legacy of Enslaved Mothers, a short film project, which is in its final stages of editing. She's currently working on an independent project and researching reconstruction in Boone County. So again, as soon as we have our opening remarks, we'll move directly to the presentation by Hillary Delaney, and then I'll be back to introduce um, three additional people uh, who have joined us this evening who will participate uh, with Hillary in a Q&A. So all of that laid out and said, I think we're ready to get started and I'm happy to turn things over to Dr. Johnson. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here this evening. I'm pleased to participate in this opening event for International Underground Railroad Month and always happy to partner with two of our great Network to Freedom programs, the Michigan Freedom Trails and Boone County Public Library. I'm excited to be participating in this event, drawing attention to 1847, which has been a special interest of mine. And Michigan Freedom Trails, I'd like to thank Michigan Freedom Trails, especially Dr. Roy Finkenbein for indulging my interest. But I really believe there is something here in exploring this history. And even if not, I think it is important to not only look at the history, to not look at history in isolation. Sometimes when looking at this history, we get so locked into looking at an event locally that we fail to look at the larger context in which these events are happening. Since at its heart, the Underground Railroad is a migration story, any escape usually touches multiple locations and communities. And so if we really want to understand this history, we really need to expand the scope of our investigations. So I'm excited to have these escapes discussed in a larger perspective, which not only help us make sense of the Underground Railroad, but larger geographic, social, economic, religious, and political transformations. So many of you here tonight may be wondering why 1847? Of course, that's when most of the events that will be discussed happen, but I think there's something more there. So, but when you think about Michigan Underground Railroad, right, the events that get the most attention are the Cross Whites, John White, the Cass County Raid, and Robert Cromwell. And these all happened in 1847, and they all involved Southern enslavers coming into Michigan, the majority from Kentucky, to retrieve freedom seekers who had escaped years before. And in looking at this and in beginning to ponder this, I began to wonder why 1847? What was going on? And in an effort to better understand the larger context, I began reaching out to folks, including the people who are partnering today on this program, um, Michigan Freedom Trails and Boone County Library. And so in talking about these things, I just want to make people aware of some of the larger things that are happening um, that may provide a framework for understanding why these events that happened in, between Michigan and Kentucky are so important. 1847 was quite an active year for Underground Railroad. 
And it was not only Michigan that was experiencing these incursions of Southern enslavers and their emissaries into the state to retrieve freedom seekers and suing those who assisted them in their efforts to avoid recapture. There were incidents in Indiana, some of which connect to the events which are recognized in Michigan. There are also incidents in Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and Ohio. All of these events are happening at a time when the slave issue is becoming increasingly divisive and in many ways, the beginning of the sectional crisis. An early book on the sectional um, movement in Virginia locates its origins in 1847. There is a perception that slavery is under threat locally, nationally, and internationally. There's growing slavery, anti-slavery support in states, even in the state of Kentucky. The Examiner, an anti-slavery newspaper, which you'll probably hear more about in just a little bit, was founded in Louisville, Kentucky in 1847. And also, 1847 is the year that Frederick Douglass publishes the North Star. Also, what we see happening in 1847 is Pennsylvania completely abolishes slavery. It also passes personal liberty laws protecting the freedoms of Blacks in the state. Pennsylvania becomes essentially free soil. It is in 1847 also that, for those of you who know me, the term slave stampede and related terms start appearing in the press. This term refers, excuse me, to enslaved people escaping in groups or several escapes from the same location in a particular space and time. It is in 1847 that you first see the appearance of the term. These escape as cooperative acts of self-determination were tantamount to small insurrections, undermining the power and authority of enslavers and exposing the vulnerability of the institution of slavery, challenging the very legitimacy of the institution itself, undermining the authority of the slaveholders and the perceived control they had over the enslaved population. In terms of kind of religious developments, one of the um, more important ones, or is this 1847 is the year that the Free Presbyterian Church is established. This effort is spearheaded by abolitionist and underground railroad operative Reverend John Rankin of Ripley, Ohio, an important destination for freedom seekers escaping on the underground um, across the Ohio River from Kentucky. And this is considered the first denomination um, specifically designated or fighting against slavery in opposition to slavery. There is also political upheaval and turmoil with the various political parties over the slave issue, particularly its westward expansion, which surfaced in the context of the Mexican War. The Mexican War resulted in what was called the Wilmot Provis Proviso, and this sought to prohibit slavery from the newly in the newly acquired territories, but it was ultimately unsuccessful. While the provision passed in the House, it failed in the Senate, but it helped deepen divides over the slave issue. Um, and it can, and the expansion, the slavery expansion question continued to be a point of serious contention, leading to serious divisions in the political parties and the formation of new parties. There are factions in the Whig and Democratic parties that would coalesce in the founding of the Free Soil Party beginning in 1847 and ultimately being found in 1848. Even the Liberty Party split and the Liberty League, a more radical offshoot of the Liberty Party, which had followers like Garrison and Frederick Douglass um, that were involved in the organization meets in New York. In 1847, states are also dealing with the slave issue. There's various attempts at constitutional reform in different states. And in Kentucky, the slave issue was front and center. A bill to call a constitutional convention passed the legislator and was sustained by the majority of voters in 1847. And both anti-slavery and pro-slavery forces saw this as an opportunity and believed they had public opinion on their side. And so there's all these perceived threats, not only to the institution of slavery, but to white supremacy. And this resulted in a fair amount of pushback at state levels, which threatened not only um, freedom seekers coming into the area, but free Blacks who had established homes in these states. Illinois held a constitutional convention in which they decided to put um, to, put to vote um, a, a measure to prohibit Black migration into the state. Missouri passed a law forbidding um, Negroes or mulatto, quote, mulattoes the right to assemble for religious worship unless services were conducted, unless a white officer was in attendance. They, the act that they passed also forbid the migration of free black people into the state. And then there was various penalties and fines um, and the fine could be upwards of $5,000, which is about equivalent to $160,000 today and jail time. 
Um, in Virginia, you have an 1847 criminal code that states any white person who shall assemble with slaves or free Negroes for the purpose of instructing them to read or write shall be punished by confinement in jail. And so you have a pushback against blacks being educated because they realize that also was an avenue to freedom. And so you also have laws that provided opportunities for lesser punishments for enslaved accused of capital crimes repealed in, in states like Kentucky in 1847. In New Jersey, African-Americans lose the right to vote. So it's not just a pushback on slavery, but it's a, a pushback on black freedom in general. And then, but at the same time you have this pushback, you also have these laws and different things upholding slavery. One of the most infamous is the Jones versus um, Van Sant Supreme Court, um, 1847 Supreme Court decision. And this was basically a decision that held that the perception of any black migrating into a free territory should be that, that, they, at the, that they're enslaved. And this really undermined kind of notions of the Underground Railroad. And it really gave slave states, right? Because they can go in and accuse someone of being uh, a freedom seeker or a fugitive slave. This really gave them the power to ultimately determine who was free and who was a, a slave. So when you have all these events happening, right? You have these arguments are being made for a stronger enforcement of the fugitive slave law. And it's in 1848 that Aunt Senator Andrew Butler of North South Carolina tries to get a bill enacted to strengthen the existing 1793 Fugitive Slave Law. And he did so in response to the events that were happening there in Michigan and escapes from Kentucky. So I think that these events are not just important for exposing the relationships between Kentucky and Michigan, but exposing to how we get in 1850 this Fugitive Slave Law. And that's why when we tend to think that even though these are local events that happen at a local level, they have these national ramifications that we need to be aware of. And looking at these events can only provide us the necessary larger context to really understand the struggle against slavery. Thank you very much. I'll now turn it over to Hillary. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for um, having us here. We're really excited to join you here and thank you to the Michigan Freedom Trail um, and Dr. Johnson uh, for your uh, context that you provided is just absolutely on the on the money there and really comprehensive and shows what's happening. Um, Angela, did you want to introduce the, the panelists before the PowerPoint? So you're going to give your presentation yep. first and then we're going to move to the key the Q and a so I thought I would do them on the back side so Perfect. that we, you won't All right. take we away can get any started time whenever you. whenever you're ready. All right, so um, we do have a lot of connections with Michigan um, and particularly e even here in Boone County and just for a little bit of uh, background Boone County is um, right where the the bottom of that arrow touches. We are at the tippy top of Kentucky and we have 40 miles of riverfront um, with the Ohio River. So our county um, borders both Indiana and Ohio. So uh, suffice it to say, we are right on the borderlands of slavery. So we did, um, the freedom seekers that came from Boone County played a big role and the slaveholders also had some impact. Um, there was some foreshadowing in what Dr. Johnson uh, talked about. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that. If we could have the next slide. So 1847, um, what was happening in Kentucky? You heard uh, a lot of the um, kind of big picture things that doc Dr. Johnson talked about. Um, and I'll tell you, uh, on a grand scale, there were, of course, political changes um, and fights going on. And, and Dr. Johnson mentioned that the the abolitionist um, paper in Louisville, the examiner was, uh, was started that year. And it's interesting because Louisville has a reputation not only as having had a lot of slave trade going on um, downriver to uh, the deep south, but also um, there were slave traders who set up shop in Louisville and got some social pushback. So there were varying opinions there, even though um, it seems like it's sort of a, a port for enslavement and slave trafficking. Um, but there were a lot of people who were becoming less and less enchanted by that and more repulsed by that. And so there was some change even within a slave state. Um, 
1847 saw some of this change in the churches. Um, there were some divisions that happened in the churches. Uh, political debates were certainly happening and the slaveholders were pushing hard for legislation strengthening their position that would ultimately um, impact the national conversation as well. Um, the Presbyterian Church, even in Kentucky, was having these debates, and there were uh, there were varying degrees of, of opinions about the abolition of slavery. Of course, there were free soilers who wanted to send people to Liberia. They saw the end of enslavement, but they were concerned about how it would be done. Um, they were also wanting to be separate, so that's a different a different form for sure. Um, the gradual emancipationists were more likely to be concerned less about um, having African Americans in the same space. That was more a financial concern, and they knew that that the end was coming, but they didn't want it to have happen so abruptly that they would lose money. And then, of course, you had true abolitionists that were um, less likely to be super vocal in a slave state, um, but they were here, and. Um, there were the pro-slavery uh, activism that was happening. We'll get into that with uh, some of these stories, but what that means to me when I say pro-slavery activism is you have the Underground Railroad, which is organized and becoming more organized and increasing in activity. Um, and we're seeing that happen in the years up to and right after 1847, but 1847 was busy. Um, there was a community of free people of co color in Madison, Indiana, which is directly across the river from Carroll County, Kentucky, which is kind of halfway between Boone County and Louisville, not far from here. And there was a lot of Underground Railroad activity happening right there to the extent that the slaveholders decided enough was enough and terrorized that community. And the result of that was one of the most successful conductors, Elijah Anderson, who was a free man of color from Virginia, he moved to Lawrenceburg which is directly, Indiana, excuse me, um, directly across from Boone County. And Boone County slaveholders felt the impact immediately. We are talking about, I don't know, 40 to 50 enslaved people making their way to freedom um, with his help very quickly. And that was 1847 when he relocated. Um, also, Levi Coffin relocated to Cincinnati, which is also very near to us here. So the community um, that was active in the Underground Railroad right on the border uh, was ramping up. Slaveholders responded in kind. They began to organize and uh, start their own sort of reverse Underground Railroads, um, setting up organizations to um, squash this activity that was hitting them in the pocketbook. So the national attention that um, Dr. Johnson mentioned with uh, Van Zant versus Jones that went to the Supreme Court this happened over and over, um, particularly with enslaved people from Boone County for some reason, and uh, more power to them for getting the attention because ultimately the end for them was that they were freed. Um, it took a little doing and it wasn't exactly legal, but um, the downside is the national laws began to, sh the opinions began to shift and the wheels of politics moved in the direction of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. So if we can have the next slide, please. So Kentucky side research, which is why I'm here. Um, we do have a lot of connections with Michigan, particularly with Boone County and Kenton County, our, our neighbor. Um, one thing that I think is really important about researching the big picture that Dr. Johnson was talking about is you get a full look at the beginning, middle and end of these stories that are so impactful and so important. Um, the pre-escape lives of freedom seekers, I am very interested in learning in my research, and I hope you'll find it interesting. I think um, understanding that these are people and what a huge, huge risk it was for them to start the process of, of self-emancipation. Um, and I think it's really important that we recognize their entire journey. Um, I also wanted to talk about how important it is to, um, in order to get to that big picture, you have to pick through all the local things and um, I'm gonna brag on Boone County a little bit. I have nothing to do with this, but we had no courthouse disasters. And so we have great records. I think most places have great records, but sometimes you have record loss. Um, local records are, are fantastic for confirming things. I often refer to my research as backward research because I'm taking the end result of an escape and I'm going backwards to figure out the details on the Kentucky side. And that's one way around that. 
um, connections, you're going to hear this word from me <laughs> a lot because it's just so true. When you are researching um, enslaved people in a slave state, you cannot ignore the history of the slaveholding family. You lose so much information if you do it that way. These connections are, um, they reach back generations in some cases. You have intermarrying between slaveholding families, which leads to enslaved people mixing and meeting and being torn apart as well. So um, finding uh, some of these connections, you have to sort of look at the big picture of the slaveholding family as well as the enslaved person. And of course, with the slaveholders, the records are more readily available and um, their records often reflect names and information about um, escapes. And we'll see some of that in this presentation later. Um, we also have some examples here in Boone County of interaction and connections between free uh, African-Americans who are either in the county or across the river and enslaved people. Um, there are some underground railroad uh, workers who were working along the river on both sides. And um, there were some enslaved people who were helping people to freedom even while they stay and stayed enslaved. We have an example here. Um, and we also have several uh, folks who were once enslaved in Boone County who moved across the river and continued their very dangerous work of helping people find their own freedom. Um, the last thing about each escape being a building block, the who, where, and how, why this is important on the Kentucky side is that it's, for one, on one hand, it's, um, it fills in all the gaps, like who helped this person? Where did they go? Why did they leave at this time? Um, how did this happen? But it's also predictive. So the more we learn about one escape, the more we learn about crossing points and routes, just like you see on free soil. And the routes, of course, do change when they're discovered, um, but we start to see patterns. And that's really helpful to keep building the story. Next slide, please. So the first um, story that I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the Kentucky end of things and give some context is Adam Crosswhite and his family. So beginning at the beginning is sort of my subtitle to that. And you'll see Adam um, on the screen, the picture of him as an older man. Um, you'll also see down in the uh, bottom left-hand corner is a primary source document. It is the will of Isaac Crosswhite. So he was the slaveholder um, of Adam and he died when Adam was about 11, 10, 11 years old. Adam was born in 1799 um, in Bourbon County, Kentucky, or Clark, one or the other. They were in both places. Um, so I blew up some of the words there to, to just show the language. So Isaac says, I give and bequeath, and this was to his daughter, Frances, as legacy, one Negro boy, Adam. He also mentions another enslaved boy named Ben. And these boys were the only of his um, seven enslaved people that he actually uses their name. Why this is important? Um, this is a nuance that sometimes escapes people that um, when a slaveholder or someone in the slaveholding family is the father of an enslaved child, um, sometimes that child actually gains some favor because they treat them a little bit differently. Or it can be harder because if uh, an enslaved uh, woman is the mother of this child, she might be seen as a threat by the, um, by the slaveholder's wife, and then there's cruelty on that side. So it's a mixed bag. But seeing those two names only, and other enslaved people are referred to as just my slaves. And sometimes that does show some sort of pattern. So it's possible that Ben was also the child of a slaveholder. Uh, I'm not sure that um, Isaac was the father. His last child by his wife was um, about 16 or 17 years before Adam was born and there were grown sons nearby as well. So it, it was somebody in the Crosswhite family likely that was his, his father. And next slide. So um, I was taking a look at the uh, early information about the Crosswhites in Bourbon and in Clark County. Um, when Isaac died, um, and, and Francis was, of, of course, supposed to receive this enslaved boy, Adam, um, there was also a public sale. And uh, I mentioned that there were, there were seven enslaved people in the estate. Um, the sale, you'll see that notice on the upper left-hand side, this happened right after the death of Isaac Crosswhite. Um, 
a number of young, likely Negroes. Adam and Ben were young. There were a couple of other um, enslaved people who were uh, under 16. So uh, the, only, the only gauge we have is a tax list that tells us that who was over 16 and who was under 16. Um, so, so I don't know if um, Adam was ever at risk of being sold at this point. Um, most of the research that I've seen was that Adam was passed to the daughter of the slaveholder, which would have been his, his own half sister or cousin or something. And um, she then married a man who was a slave trader, who you'll see on here as Ned Stone. Um, I didn't find evidence of a marriage between Francis and Ned Stone. What I did find was marriage between Thomas Crosswhite, who was Isaac's son, and Rachel Stone, who is Ned Stone's sister. These two families intermarried more than just this one time. Um, but regardless of that, the fate of Adam in his next move to the next slaveholder was that he was in the hands of Ned Stone. And Ned Stone was, um, was a man to be feared in this situation. He was the man that would break the slaves, meaning break their spirit, um, punish their bodies. And he also sold people in great number up and down the river. His home is this beautiful home and still stands in Bourbon County. I think it was on, it was for sale recently. And I looked at pictures of it and I thought, gosh, who can live there? Uh, there is an outbuilding that is set up um, as sort of a jail. It has bars on the windows. There is beneath the front hall of this building, there is um, a dungeon like chamber, which I imagine was probably a solitary confinement or punishment area. Um, so it's upsetting to hear that and to see a beautiful home for sale and know that that's its history. But I wondered as I was learning this about Ned Stone and his relationship to Adam, did he buy him because this was a family transaction or was it because Adam had light skin and he wanted someone to work in his home that looked um, light skinned, which was a pattern. And, um, and, and people were more valuable as enslaved people uh, for that work if they had a lighter complexion. And so the reality is he could have made more money from selling him as well. But Ned Stone, um, here's the, the karma uh, research note is Ned Stone and some of his associates were um, taking 75 souls to the deep south to sell. And those folks rose up and took the lives of these men on the river. And of course that was, you know, that was big, big news. The biggest fear of the slaver was um, to have an uprising happen and it did in this case. And um, that's sort of an indication to me that you can only push people but so far, but he was quite the pusher. And so that was, that was the end of, of Ned Stone. And you can see in this article, um, uh, that the language used, it's a horrible massacre, et cetera. You never hear that language referred to the selling of humans from these same newspapers at the same time. But it is a sort of a, a note of karma there. Um, so at some point before that 1826 event, um, Ned sold Adam to a man named Francis Giltner who lived in Carroll County. Now remember Carroll County is right across from Madison, Indiana where there was some underground railroad traffic happening. But um, at the point that Adam enters the life of um, uh, the enslaved people who lived on that farm, uh, he, he was still a young man. So can we have the next slide? So Adam met his wife, Sarah, on the Giltner farm and they started a family. So when you look at the, at the sort of the basic points of what happens next, He's sold, he's right there on a farm, right across the river from people who could help him to freedom, but he stayed for 20 years more. And why was that? Um, because he was in love and had a family and his wife uh, had four children by the time they left that place. Um, and so um, it's difficult to imagine going to the grocery store with four children, but can you imagine risking life and limb uh, with these children and trying to find freedom. Um, luckily for the Crosswhite family, George de Baptiste, who was a freeborn man of color who lived in Madison, he was an associate of Elijah Anderson, who I spoke of earlier. He was, um, he's credited with conducting this family to freedom. 
And this was in the, we weren't quite at 1847 yet. Um, it was just a few years before that time. But again, remember, things are starting to increase. This traffic is increasing in the Underground Railroad. The slaveholders are getting nervous and they're reacting to this and the politics are ramping up. The churches are ramping up. Um, a little side note is um, George de Baptiste also worked uh, as a valet to um, President Harrison. President Harrison is buried um, directly across the river from Boone County and his family was married uh, to some Boone County families, members of his family. And uh, I wonder if, if uh, George de Baptiste had any hand in helping some people in Boone County that made me think of that. Um, so, so some dramatic events that, um, that happened with the cross lights um, happened in 1847, but I'm not gonna tell you because I wanna tempt you to come to the next presentation regarding uh, the cross white family and hear more about this. But what I can tell you is um, they were gone for several years and there was a, one of these groups that I said were, were um, pro-slavery activists um, had formed in Boone and Kenton counties and they offered their services uh, to members of their sort of a co-op for slave hunting, if you will. Um, they, uh, they formed this association called Association for Securing Our Servants which is a nice way of saying we're slave hunting. They offered um, to help other uh, slaveholders within all, all through the state who could pay them dues on a regular basis that were small. But when they were called upon, when they needed help, um, then, then this association would um, send their slave hunters or their spies ahead to start the process to help them reclaim their uh, freedom seekers who had left them. If they were not members, um, then maybe they were out of luck and had to do it on their own. So this was kind of a, a bold but smart move. Uh, the Association for Securing Our Servants also was, they, have a, they had a board, um, board of trustees, I guess. And those men were all powerful and connected and some of them ran for office. So you had movers and shakers there um, who were fighting to keep uh, their rights as slaveholders, which was, was, went on for a long time, but was really peaking in 1847. So in, in January of that year, um, Francis Giltner, who was the last slaveholder to hold the cross whites, um, who was his, his grandson was named for him. His, he was also Francis, but his last name was Troutman. Um, he gathered a posse, including his own father, and they, um, on the information they had obtained by a spy that worked for the association, um, they left to go see if they could find the cross whites. Now, Next week, you can find out what else happened to them. So I'm going to leave you hanging a little bit because I want you to come back and hear what happened in Michigan. Um, so there's a lot of connections too. I just want to make mention um, throughout this uh, Bourbon County and Boone and Kenton counties with family names. So when I was looking at the Cross White family, I realized that there were Timberlakes, and you'll hear that name in a few minutes, but Timberlakes that were involved with um, some of the cross whites and there were some other family names that came up like Buckner, uh, Clarkson, all of these families are back and forth between these counties. So there is a network of slaveholders that's happening. Next slide, please. Kentucky raids, um, Cass County, this is a big one. So there, these were two waves of escapes, although there may have been more that were smaller. Um, of Boone and Kenton County enslaved people who were freedom seekers that made it to Cass County, which is where they settled. Um, in the spring of 1847, these two huge groups left uh, a couple weeks apart um, from this area and settled in, in Cass County or, or landed in Cass County where they, they found a friendly community. So that association for securing our servants, they did kick into high gear. Um, the reason they kicked into high gear is because ironically, uh, several of the board members of this association, their enslaved people were some of these freedom seekers, which is a sweet, sweet irony. Uh, but they did, they did start their planning, they sent their spy, um, and they began to think about how they could ambush this great number of people. Um, you see the, the, the handbill up on the uh, right hand side of the slide, that's really a warning. Um, this was distributed in free soil when, uh, they, when the, the supportive communities and the allies 
knew that there were people lurking around that would do harm to these freedom seekers. And so they would, they would warn them any way they could. Um, so what happened in Cass County on that side, I'm, I'm going to do it again. I'm not going to tell you, but it's funny to me that the slaveholders in all the Southern states who knew about this called it the Cassa, Cassopolis outrage, but we know it was the Kentucky raid. Um, and so to learn what was so outrageous, you're gonna to have to wait a couple of weeks to hear that end of things, but I am gonna tell you a little bit more about what was happening on this end with the reverse Underground Railroad and um, all of the background of these groups. Next slide, please. So you can see that big number right there, $3,125 reward for 18 enslaved people that came from several different slaveholders. Um, the, the enslaved people who were the freedom seekers in this case, uh, they are named and claimed in, within this ad by a variety of enslaved people. At the bottom, you see the name Thornton Timberlake. So I just told you about a Timberlake that was uh, connected to the cross white. So it's all a big loop. Um, but three, $3,125, depending on what valuation calculator you use, is in the neighborhood of over $100,000. So this, this is a biggie. Um, and this was not even the full group, I don't think, of this first wave. The second wave had about 12, I believe, um, uh, freedom seekers, and we don't know as many of their names, but we do know a lot of these names due to this ad. Um, also, some research on the back end gives us some information. So um, this particular uh, event was really complicated because of the large number of people involved and, and in turn, the large number of um, slaveholders as well. So these slaveholders from Boone and Kenton County um, involved in these two waves of escapes were intermarried. Um, and these family connections are very helpful in seeing the through lines and understanding where the properties are, give you an idea of the route they may have taken. Um, and they also, a great majority of these slaveholders um, all attended Dry Creek Baptist Church. And Dry Creek Baptist Church had um, services for enslaved members as well. Um, this would often give them an opportunity to to get together and to, um, in some cases to plan. So it's really important to know that and to know that Dry Creek Baptist Church is sort of in the center of the properties um, from which these people escaped. And if I can have the next slide, please. Again, with that word connections. So here's one example. Um, if you look in the top right hand corner, Thornton Timberlake and Alex Sanford were two of the slaveholders that. Um, were on that, um, on that flyer that you saw, the reward flyer. And uh, another man, Thomas Buckner, who had already passed in uh, 1844, um, those, those three, or I'm sorry, those three men were all brothers-in-law through their wives who were sisters. So their wives um, came from the Berry family. And uh, what this means to me as a researcher is that of course these families were connected. They sort of lived near each other um, the enslaved people were probably distributed kind of here and there, but it goes back another generation because the Barry women probably inherited enslaved people from their parents. And so this connection keeps going. So you have this intermingling of people coming together and being pulled apart. Um, but in this case, they live close by each other. So it makes sense that they might plan together. If you look at the um, document, the little clipping of the document to the left, um, there's an inventory there and um, it just shows some of the value and some of the names, but there's a note at the bottom and this is actually a settlement, um, but they did another inventory um, in 1849. So sometime between the first appraisal of the enslaved people of this Thomas Buckner um, and the last settlement amount, sometime between those two dates in five years around 1847 on either side, uh, there's a little note that says that the um their five slave slaves who had run off and there it is right there in print so that's a really great hint if anyone is researching um underground railroad uh escapes is if you can identify um, a slaveholder look in their settlement if they've died because it's almost always documented there and that's a that was a happy accident that i found at one point during my research and now i always look but so because they're named um that's helpful on the opposite end of the research. You can start to look for them. They may or may not keep the same names, um, 
but we do know that there were five people that we may find amongst the other freedom seekers who left from this extended family. Uh, the three people who remained in this settlement were sold out of the family. So that is a sad thing to know, um, but still important information to have. And the next slide, please. So this, this story, this is the third story I'm gonna tell, and then I'm gonna turn you all loose to ask questions. Near and dear to my heart, um, you heard uh, perhaps in my introduction that we have a, an Underground Railroad in Boone County bus tour. Um, John Felix White um, features in that tour and so does his family. So we know quite a bit about him, but there's a big chunk of missing information still. Um, and there's that connection between Michigan and Boone County again. This man is um, somewhat remarkable in my estimation. Uh, he is, he's definitely bold. <laughs> um, we don't know the circumstances of his escape from Boone County. We just know that the person who owned him or claimed ownership of him when uh, he left the county and self-emancipated was George Washington Brasher. And you'll see him up in the, in the corner of the slide. He's looking smug and self-satisfied. That man was, um, he was cruel. Um, he was uh, very, uh, bold in his own way, but not in a good way, and violent. Um, he, he was part of a group of people who, who went up to Cass County um, during that time in 1847. And while he was there, he decided that he would go looking for John White, who had left him several years before. Um, John White came from Virginia and was separated from his mother at a young age, and at some point um, was turned over to, to George Washington Brasher and Brasher sold people to the South. And he also did slave hunting. Um, he was wealthy and he was a state legislator at one point. There was no reason he couldn't hire someone to do that. Awful work, but I think he liked to do it. And he had his eyes on John White because he really was angry that this guy got away from him. If you look um, on the left-hand side of the screen, it may be a little difficult to read, but I can give you the, uh, a general idea. Um, this, this letter was published in the Indiana Palladium that was um, a, a, a border paper that was published in the air right across the river from Boone County. And they were, um, they had run an earlier article accusing um, Brasher of kidnapping a free man in Indiana and holding him hostage there. And this was way back 20 years earlier, 1826. So he'd been practicing his evil skills for a while. Um, he was bold enough that he decided, even though that that sort of had been decided and not in Brasher's favor, that he would answer this with an angry letter. So it's just a sort of a illustration of his character or lack thereof. Um, so John White um, was not in great hands and he took off. Uh, he left behind a, a wife and five children. And so um, he ended up in Michigan and he uh, befriended uh, Laura Smith Haviland and attended her, her practical skills school in Adrian at the Raisin Institute. Um, I can't tell you a lot about what happened in between. We know in 1847 that Brasher, as I said before, was in Cass County and he had learned, thanks to the Association for Securing Our Servants again, that John White was in Michigan. And so um, dramatic events followed, but you're going to have to join the next presentation on the 23rd to find out what that is, what happened and what went down. But I can give you some background a little bit on the other end of John White's story, which we know more about. So if I can have the next slide, I will finish up with that. So you see Levi Coffin on the left and you see Laura Smith Havlin on the right. Both of these well-known uh, abolitionist and Underground Railroad heroes um, wrote about John White. Again, he was bold and he made an impact. So we know a little about him thanks to their, um, their uh, reminiscences of him and um, some of the things that happened. Um, John White decided that he had had uh, enough time away from his family, he wanted them to be free. And so it was of course easier for him to have left on his own initially because there were young children. Uh, but he, he intended, I believe, to, to have his family free the, the entire time, and he was really missing them. He asked Laura Smith Haviland to please travel to um, Boone County and see if she could help get them to freedom. And so she was, of course, associated with the anti-slavery 
movement in Cincinnati by that time. Um, uh, Levi Coffin was living in Cincinnati. He moved there in 1847, if you can believe that. Um, this was a little bit later. Uh, this was like mid to late 1848. And um, so Laura Smith Haviland connected with some free people of color, some of them former, formerly enslaved in Boone County who were working as agents and conductors in Rising Sun, Indiana, which is directly across the river from where uh, John's family lived in Rabbit Hash. And that's a real place, I promise. Uh, <laughs> So she went and met with uh, his family and um, the circumstances were not great. And so um, she had to leave. And then she came back again and she was thwarted again because the river was high this time. And she was warned by an enslaved man who was a friend of John White's that, um, that there was traffic, more increased traffic of patrollers on the river. And so it was not a good time. Um, so she left and went back to Michigan and said, listen, I've tried twice, I'm so sorry. John White said, you know what? I'm a wanted man, but I'm going. And so uh, he went back for his family. They tried to, he and his friend who was named William Allen, who was the man who gave Flora Smith Haviland information, helped to get the family off the farm and into a boat and on the river, but the river was up and they washed down and ashore to the waiting arms of patrollers. The family just scattered at this point and John White's friend basically held him back while his family was recaptured and hid him because John White would have been um, in, in dire circumstances because he was still a wanted man and by Brasher, especially. Um, some of the story that we know of from Laura Smith Haviland, actually, I made a little research note that sometimes stories change. Um, her narrative was, was probably fed to her by the slaveholder Jane, of Jane and her children who was um, Benjamin Stevens. And Laura Smith Haviland wrote him letters to shame him, but he sold them. And actually Jane was his daughter. Um, so he sold his daughter and um, grandchildren. And then Laura was told that, that Jane died and the children were all sold off together. But we learned recently that Jane did not die. So that's good news. Uh, but unfortunately, John was separated. He made it a couple of days without getting caught and then he was caught, but he was clever. Um, so if I can have the next slide, I'll tell you what happened. So we see Frederick Douglass looking very stern and clear eyed there. Um, I like to say that part of John's appeal for me is that boy, did he make an impact. Like all the big names, well-known people in the Underground Railroad um, were talking about John White. Um, Frederick Douglass published two articles in 1849 um, in support of John White. He had been captured, he was in jail. By this point in time, um, Brasher was out of town. He was taking a group of slaves to the deep south to sell. While he was gone, he died of cholera. Um, but John didn't know that. He was at risk. He was in jail. And the man who had caught him was a famous slave catcher named Wright Ray, who knew Brasher. So John quickly gave a, a fake name. Um, he somehow managed to contact Levi Coffin, who had been working in tandem with the rest of the anti-slavery web, including um, Frederick Douglass who wrote articles pleading for help in the form of financial support so that John could be purchased from this slave catcher. Um, we know very little about that first flight, right, uh, from Boone County. And so um, that's gonna be something that I will continue to look for because I think there's way more to the story. What I do know is that um, White continued to be a fixture he returned to Michigan and then Canada for a little while and then back to Michigan, he remarried. Um, Jane eventually remarried, so you understand the fairness of this. <laughs> um, I also wanted to call out the fact that, that um, in addition to the free um, conductors and agents that worked across the river in assistance of trying to get his family free, um, William Allen, again, I just wanna repeat his name, he was enslaved in Boone County and he helped and I don't know if he helped more people than just this family, but he was helping. So we need to remember that there are enslaved people who are also conductors and agents. And, and it's so nice to have a name that we can recognize them. Um, the names of the people who were free were the Berkshire family and the Eddington family. Um, the other thing that's on the opposite, opposite side of this page is uh, just a, uh, a little article advertising the public meeting at the establishment of the Association for Securing Our Servants. Um, they really thought of this as this legitimate sort of, you know, 
upstanding and I guess it was legal, but it just seems seems funny to me that they have resolutions and they print it in the paper. But the another interesting thing is they met at that Dry Creek Church where we think some of the Cass County freedom seekers um, made their plans. Um, and so uh, with that, we'll go to the next slide. Just a summary, um, those pre-escape connections, and I know I say connections too much, but it's so important to help complete the story. And just to repeat that, uh, what we draw from this is um, using those connections between slave holding families and enslaved people and locations and routes. Um, that helps us in, in many ways to fill in local research um, approach that's really helpful. And you'll see some of our panelists have those um, knowing the names in the county, knowing the locations, knowing who went to which church can be so very helpful in understanding these escapes and, and provide some insight. Um, so I would like to offer you all the opportunity to meet our panelists. Michigan Freedom Trail Commission and uh, chair of the history department at the University of Michigan. Um, we're going to invite some more voices into this conversation. Um, we, we have three people who are joining us for a panel discussion, which will be some of their own thoughts and feelings about Hillary's wonderful presentation, as well as um, uh, threading in some of the great questions that are coming from the chat. So when I tell you a little bit about them, um, do feel free to take the time to uh, enter any other questions you have into the chat. I'm really happy to welcome Dr. Eric Jackson. You can kind of wave at the, thank you, Eric. As a professor of history with almost 29 years of academic experience at the university level, Dr. Jackson has taught numerous classes in the fields of African um, American and African-American history, race relations, and peace studies. Dr. Jackson has also published a wide array of books, book reviews, articles, uh, and many local, regional, and national and international journals, including a recently completed online book slash website on African-Americans in Cincinnati, uh, which was published in 2015 by Oxford University Press. He's also the book review editor of the Journal of Pan-African Studies and has served on the Boone County Historic Preservation Review Board and is a member of the Kentucky Historic Preservation Review Board and the Vice President of the Boone County Public Library Board of Trustees. Uh, we also have Lisa Schumann. Can you wave Lisa at everybody? Good to see you this evening. Um, Lisa is an experienced local historian and genealogy researcher with a focus on Northern Kentucky and Greater Cincinnati. She's a member of the College Hill, Ohio, a member of the College Hill, Ohio, and um, societies and please correct the butchering I just did of that name Lisa oh my goodness so sorry uh, and the Hamilton Avenue Road to Freedom group additionally she's a genealogy researcher for the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center um, and the John Parker Library uh, after retiring from a 35-year career as an elementary art teacher in 2013. Oh, wonderful. Lisa began a project uh, researching a brother and sister helped by the Timberlake family and a different path their lives took. The school where Lisa once taught is on the property that once belonged to the Timberlake family um, who were involved in the Kentucky raids in Cass County, Michigan. Uh, and finally, we have Trina Robinson. Um, Trina Robinson is a visual artist based in San Francisco who is interested in exploring memory and migration through video, archival materials, uh, and text. Her work has been exhibited at art galleries and film festivals throughout the country. She's also told the story of exploring her ancestry um, with the moth main stage, I love that, on stages throughout the country, including New York's Lincoln Center and NPR's Moth Radio Hour. I'm an avid listener to that show. She previously has worked in print and digital media uh, as a managing editor and production editor, and is currently pursuing an MFA uh, in fine arts at uh, California College of the Arts. Really happy to have them all here with us this evening. Um, 
while we kind of get set up uh, with feeding in some questions from the chat, I want to take a moderator's prerogative and, and start with a question for Trina, um, which is, can you talk a little bit about your experience as a descendant of enslaved people doing research on, on a former slave state and interacting with this material, especially as a, as a, 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 a visual artist? Thank you so much, Angela. Yeah, um, that's the part of Hillary's presentation that really, really got my interest because, yeah, that's the Kentucky side is the, the Kentucky side of the research is the meat of, of, of what I do. And I when I come down to, you know, I, I've worked with people like, you know, on the phone who are getting files for me. But when I actually come down to do the research myself, that's when I'm able to find like the non obvious things because I can spend days. You know, um, one time, you know, for example, one of the big examples is uh, most recently, um, the University of Kentucky archives. I was there um, doing some research in my family history. Um, they were owned by you know, Richard French, a former Kentucky um, congressman. Um, he died in 1854, and I was his archives are um, the family entire family archives are are there, and. Um, you know, I'd spoken with some people, and I got like a few things, the obvious things. But when I was there for three days. I was just going through all kinds of files, just looking for names that had that you would think had nothing to do with my fam, with my ancestors. But because they're a property, you don't know when these people's names are going to pop up and where they're going to pop up. So, on file, um, let's say at like at the Montgomery County Courthouse, um, Richard French's father, James French, uh, he had, his will is on on file, and I've had a copy of that for years, and it gave me a lot of information. I learned about my great 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 grandfather. Um, but then when I went to University of Kentucky, their archives, they had drafts of that will, earlier drafts he had written, and they broke down the family units of that family. So like all those names that were listed on that final version in the courthouse, he broke, he broke it up. So I learned who Martin mother was. So I, I learned who my great, 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 great grandmother was because it said in the will, Martha and I mean, um, Nancy and her, her and her children. And then, um, yeah, so like that, that's why if you go and do this on site Kentucky or on site Southern research, you and do it yourself. You know, if you got the time, you can just unearth all kinds of things that are sitting and um, um, they're hidden in plain sight, you know, and that's why um, just going down to Kentucky has just been a gift. It's the gift of time. You know, you just and you know, also because you have more interest in it too, because it's your family or your subject that you're looking into. So, uh, if you're paying somebody to do the research, you know they're going to send you the files. Like they might not want, you know, they they don't have that drive and that hunger and that curiosity that you might have. So, like going down, going down south, doing that research, sitting in those dusty courthouses, it can change your life. I'm often struck by the power of genealogy and family in this history. And, and so I want to invite the other panelists to maybe riff on that a little bit. Um, also in relation to a question that we have um, from Mr. Holman, hi, who's been a great participant um, this evening and has a link to, uh, a, 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 has a family link to escaping from Kentucky um, and wants to know how um, he can learn more about his family's activities in the Underground Railroad. Also, um, it's curious about whether or not there's a connection between the Michigan steamer, steamer's owner slash operators and the Underground Railroad, which comes from some of the family connected genealogical work that he's been doing. So on this genealogy, family connections, how do we find more? What is it like to, to do this kind of work? So Lisa, could you give an example from your work that you've done um, that was connected to the, the Cass County um, escape just to show how far you can go? Sure, sure. Um, my research really focused very, very narrowly on two people, a brother and a sister, um, Gabriel Timberlake and Mary Jane French. They were both enslaved by the Timberlake family and um, Gabriel left in 1847 with the others and made it to Canada where, you know, and of course a lot went on between the time that he left and the time he got to Canada. But when he got there, he 
bought property and had a farm and started a family. And Mary Jane ended up staying until after the Civil War. And her home was burnt down numerous times and she realized she had to leave. And she had to take, um, she had numerous children by then. She had um, her brother, her elderly mother, um, other children, nieces, nephews, and they all left the Erlanger area and made their way through Cincinnati all the way into College Hill, which is by the way, also a very um, well used uh, stop on the Underground Railroad by Levi Cawthon. But in doing this research, it was a combination of researching, of course, the, um, the documents, the, the wills, the deeds, and all these things, the Timberlake family, the genealogy, as well as the genealogy of Mary Jane and her family, as well as Gabriel Timberlake, who changed his name to James Johnson when he made it to Canada. And she goes to a lot of cemeteries. I'm just going to tell you that right now. <laughs> yes, and that's kind of how it all started with yeah. the cemetery. It yeah. did, yeah. But following time. that genealogy is is a superpower of Lisa's for sure, because she was able to get a lot of, uh, she's gotten further beyond the escape even. Um, she has the local knowledge, but she followed them, you know, to points north, these two separated siblings who occasionally got back together, right? <laughs> they, that's the amazing thing. Somehow she made her way to Canada to visit um, James Johnson, Gabriel Timberlake, and left him with, um, took some sleigh bells with her that he had on the horse back on the Timberlake farm. And those sleigh bells are still at the Amherstburg Freedom Museum, where they were, uh, they're on display there. Great, Eric, are you trying to join the conversation? You need to unmute. There you go. I, I, I was going in a different direction because I think that the understanding the freedom seekers and the experience of enslaved African-Americans needs to be at the center of the analysis to kind of demystify this, this belief that African Americans were not active participants in their own escape attempts, and to understand that they're active participants in their process of escaping, understanding that they they go through um, mental health and trauma consistently under this institution of enslavement, but they figure out how to survive. And so they have to be at the center of the analysis to, to, to understand their humanity. And I think a lot of times the narratives and some of the Underground Railroad research writing does not get into making them human, of understanding their humanity, which has to be part of the discussion consistently to understand that, that plight. You know, with Trina, what Trina said about finding, um, being connected and finding these family groups in those earlier wills, that's part of what you're talking about, I think, Dr. Jackson. You know, she was able to connect these people together as a family unit and understand the mothers and the children together, which is, you know, that's a, that's a big part of that. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think particularly nowadays going through what we're going through now with, 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 with COVID, Mental health is an issue that folks don't want to talk right. about until they're forced. They don't want to talk to about mental health. They just don't, or trauma. Right. Right. Don't want to deal with it. But now you're forced to deal with it. And you find that in, in historical context of Africa. And, and that's why I understand the, the power of understanding that African-American history, Underground Railroad in particular, is they went through that and came through the other side by whatever means that was necessary. So coming through that and getting to the other side to me is the most inspirational part mm -hmm. of African-American mm -hmm. survival skills. Um, I know that uh, uh, Trina and in her research, I think that's what brought you and Lisa Schumann together, right, Trina? 
Um, they did some re research together because I know you heard the name French in both of those um, comments. Uh, but Trina's ancestor, what, uh, just to sort of riff off of what you were saying, Dr. Jackson, um, he he worked and earned enough money to buy his entire family, right, Trina? Is that right? Yeah. So um, my great 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 grandfather Martin French, um, again, who is a part of Lisa's story, is I mean, he, he that that family enslaved family is a part of Lisa's story, not he specifically, but he um, was freed in that in that will that I was mentioning. And it said that in 1856, he was supposed to go out free. He actually was, he went to Covington and he apparently worked um, as a whitewasher or plasterer because he's listed with a group of plasterers in the census or whitewashers in the 1860 census in Covington. And then in an 1870 census in Chicago, he's listed as a plasterer. So he went back in 1860 to Mount Sterling and purchased um, most of his family, um, not my great great grandfather, but most of his family, the, his like immediate, the, the young, yeah. very young children and his wife at that time. Um, and they moved to Winchester. They didn't leave. They, cause there were obviously some who were still enslaved. Right. And so they stayed there and they came to Chicago, 1866 um, or 1868. I, you know, I, I've, I've seen different dates. But um, yeah, and uh, but yeah, he he purchased. And I'm forgetting the amount, but I I actually have the Lisa. I think you like t first told me about that document as well. Um, you know the, the amount that he paid for for them, and it was I mean it's unbelievable that he was able to do that. Within that document, if you don't mind me um, saying, yeah. was also John French, who I believe was married to Mary Jane French. That's who fathered her children. And I think it's important to note that when she left with this extended family, her children, her mother, and other family members, there was no husband with her. She made it all the way through Cincinnati up to College Hill and lived out her life without ever remarrying. And, and to me, the fact that they were torn apart because she said that um, he had been sold south, which I believe was probably probably down to Mount Sterling because Richard French lived right behind the Timberlake property. Um, in fact, the property ended up being sold to the Timberlake family. So, and one of the Timberlakes married one of the Frenches. So this is how we ended up with the, the Frenches over at the Timberlakes and so on, just like you said. Connections, can I just call that out? We see them all over the place and they're there. But I do think um, in those stories where you have these incredible Feats where I mean, how do you as as a whitewasher and a plasterer make enough money to buy a family of enslaved people's freedom, right? And so you have examples of trauma and and examples of this incredible focus and and uh, ambition and strength that's driven by you know love for your family. But but I it always makes me feel like I don't get much done in my life when I hear those stories because it's remarkable, right? Amazing and uplifting too, if I can add that. Absolutely. And kind of while we're sort of pondering um, genealogy a little bit, let me let uh, our um, uh, guests this evening know that one of the people behind the scenes is, scenes is Bridget Stryker, uh, who's a local history coordinator at the Boone County Public Library. Bridget has been there since 2001 and has led the local history department since 2005. Uh, and under her leadership, um, the local history department has developed a strong presence within Kentucky and the Ohio Valley region as an innovative local history organizer. And she wants you to know that you can reach out to her if you have questions about specific family members um, and that she and her team are really happy to provide some one-on-one -on -one coordination. Let me also acknowledge that Catherine Wilson has dropped a really helpful note into the chat um, referencing the Fred Hart Williams Genealogical Society yes. uh, uh, in Detroit as another source for tracing these kinds of stories. Um, so we have a, another question that maybe moves us a little bit off of genealogy, but still, um, you know, within the, the um, landscape of, of Hillary's um, wonderful presentation. This one is from Rex Hauser. Um, who wants to know if there are any ties to the history of slavery and anti-slavery in Nicholas County, Kentucky, in regards to any of this history? Um, I, I can't summon it off the top of my head. 
what I do when I'm doing research, because I started expanding my focus outside of my own county, is I start these little folders, and Bridget could tell you how much space I take up on our, our, on our drive at work, but, but I start gathering little bits and pieces. Um, and I can, I'd be happy to look. You can contact us at the library and our, our information, um, local history at bcpl.org. Um, that will come to somebody on our team, myself, Bridget, or um, there are three other people in the, in the department. Um, and I'd be happy to look into it. I can't think of it off the top of my head right now. Um, Dr. Jackson, have you heard of anything in Nicholas County? No, there, there may be something though. So, you know, I like to, I like a mystery. <laughs> Please get in touch. Great, and uh, we have a question for Trina in particular. Um, there are a few people with us this evening. They're really interested to know where they can view um, more of your art um, that's yeah. based on your family research. Thank you for asking. I can, um, I'll put my website on here and there's some links and then I could um, always like, I could always share some other information later if you reach out. Um, to the email address there, but um, there's some links on my visual website. I'll just post it in the in the chat. Thank you for asking. Great. <laughs> yeah, and, that, and, and yeah, uh, just to be quick, um, I used to have a whole other career before any of this. Like I said, I worked in magazine publishing and then briefly in tech, and it was the family history. It was learning my family history. It was getting that. That's what let me led me to move to this new path. Like I, I, I gave me a sense of identity and a sense of story and place for myself that I never had before. You know, I always felt very grounded in who I was, but like having this new information about my family's history changed literally how I saw myself and, and how it fit in the world, how I fit in the world, my family story fit in the world. And I wanted, I want others to see themselves through my stories and empower people to realize it's gonna take, if you're African-American especially, it might take a bit longer if you wanted to look for your family history, but it is possible. It's a lot more work. You are gonna have to travel, <laughs> um, but it's possible. And then it's, it's important to say their names and have yep. um, and unearth these stories and, you know, put them out there any way you can, you know. We're huge fans of Trina's work here, by the way. <laughs> She does great stuff. Thank you. Um, could, could I, uh, if you don't mind, Angela, could I just um, make mention to Lisa that someone was asking more about the College Hill uh, groups. So it, she could probably awesome. answer that better than I could. Yes, thank you for asking. Um, to find out more about College Hill, if it's a resource you're looking for, the College Hill Historical Society has a presence on Facebook and that's phenomenal. But the group that really focuses on the Underground Railroad as it relates to College Hill is called the Hamilton Avenue Road to Freedom. And they also have a website, which is phenomenal. It's full of maps and um, primary documents. And uh, Betty Ann Smitty has been instrumental in writing. She wrote a wonderful piece on um, John Hatfield, and I'm not sure we even mentioned John Hatfield was part of this 1847 escape, a free man of color and deacon for the Zion Baptist Church. And she's written a biographical booklet that is actually on the website for free. So I hope that that helps. Terrific, we have a question from the chat for Dr. Jackson um, on, can, can you say a little bit more, reflect a little bit about um, Northern Kentucky's significance uh, in the greater Underground Railroad history and kind of how, like, why, why would focusing there maybe help us to think about this history differently or shift the focus or the frame in, in any significant ways? Well, a, a number of prominent historians and, and, and have made the argument particularly when the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center was conceptualized and created back in 2004, that this area was one of the major corridors of uh, freedom seekers 
saying that 40 to 50 percent, sometimes 60 percent of those folks who sought their freedom from the south to the north came through this corridor, this corridor that connects the states of Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky. Um, and so it's important to understand, even if the numbers are questionable, that a good number of folks use this, this major corridor to escape from enslavement um, from the south to the north and dispersed to different areas. Some ended up in Michigan, Indiana, as far north as, as Canada. But this is a major thoroughfare for underground railroad activity, underground railroad research, African-American communities that were founded on both sides of the river, countering the dominant culture of trying to define African-Americans as property. African-Americans define themselves as human beings. And so this corridor is, in, is important to, to kind of change the challenge the, the narrative of how to understand the origins and the development of the Underground Railroad in general. I, I think it's really fab, fabulous to be able to focus in on, on that region, you know, to open up new kinds of insights and new sorts of information. Hillary, there's a question for you from Marie Sanders, um, which is, do you have any information on William Allen? Muted. Sorry, I was muted. Um, so I my answer is ongoing. <laughs> um, William Allen, the name William Allen, there are a whole lot of William Allens. I'm not um, completely unconvinced that I haven't found him in some of those instances, but I, I really am going to have to learn more about that, the beginning um, escape that John Felix White made because they were friends and he wanted to help him enough to put himself in, at risk, right? Um, and so I know they were friends and, and part of that would have to be proximity. Um, we know where the Allen family was. We just need to know where John White was. And I need to figure out if they were around the same age. I think they probably were because there's some mention um, of the reason William Allen stayed in Boone County was because he had a family who likely were held by a different slaveholder who were keeping them tightly held and he didn't want to risk losing his family. Um, and so so the, the long answer is it's that, but the short answer is it's ongoing. And please feel free to contact me. Um, we can talk about it some more. Yes, Bridget has um, helpfully uh, dropped your contact Thank information you. into the yep. chat. And you know, after uh, to tonight's conversation, we'll be sending out an email that has um, links and much more information that summarizes um, a, a lot of the things that have been mentioned. Lisa, we have a question for you about um, what you might know about the, the escapes uh, that and that kind of led into Cass County. Well, I think Hillary probably touched on a lot of it. Um, what I learned about were all the connections. I mean, that just can't be um, emphasized enough that once you start researching these slave owners and if you can um, get historical maps and find locations, it really shows all the connections by marriage, by location, even by church because of the Dry Creek um, Baptist Church connection. But what we also learned is that um, the marriage connections sometimes caused people to be able to be together to share information, but it also, like Hillary said, caused them to be pulled apart and torn away from family members as well. Um, the other thing that um, was interesting to me about it is, are the events leading up to it. And I know we talked about Levi Coffin and John Hatfield, but um, in the Licking Valley Register, there was an interesting piece where William Holman Jones, who was from Cass County, I believe, um, he said that he had, had attended a slave wedding prior to this escape that we're talking about to talk to the slaves about escape details. So it shows that here in 1847, people are um, abolitionists and others are interjecting themselves even right onto the property to start um, sharing information and giving people ideas on how it can be done. 
And then the last thing is the escape route, which I found fascinating, is Dixie Highway, which seemed to connect everybody. Um, there were some people living sort of off to the west, but they were connected by a main road. And don't you know, at the end of the main road, there's Dry Creek Baptist Church, where it connects right to Dixie Highway. That would have taken them right to the river. So I hope that answers. That's correct. Can I just add to that, that that was 1847, but um, almost 10 years later, <laughs> Margaret Garner and her family took this same route, but they went from much further south and it sounds crazy. I know that some of the escape narratives say that they were running through fields, but that's the artery, just like following the river. They're following this main thoroughfare that was Lexington to Covington Turnpike, which came to be known as Dixie Highway. And in the case of the Garner family, they had a wagon so they could go straight down the road fast and furious, right? Um, these people did not um, likely have a wagon. And so um, what, what Lisa and I talked about a little bit was the terrain in Northern Kentucky is very hilly and very steep in parts. So I imagine they, they probably did have to um, occasionally get nearer to the road in order to get down that hill towards, um, towards the river, so. Thank you so much. You know, so to, tonight's conversation has been a, a kind of opening gesture, right, towards, you know, kind of mu multiple conversations that we're going to be having that kind of circle around 1847 and what makes this important. Um, so can we do like a lightning round, kind of, you know, 30 seconds from each of you on kind of what's a takeaway for us to carry forward into the other conversations that we're going to be having this month about this topic and these materials? And I'm really hoping that that Dr. Jackson will talk a little bit about self-emancipation, right? And kind of centering the experience of uh, the enslaved freedom seekers themselves. 30 exactly. seconds. Exactly. So I, I think I think that self-emancipation is important because um, the, the, the broader context of self-emancipation has to do with this whole concept of resistance, of African Americans resisting that that runaways and the Underground Railroad. Is, it's just one aspect of resisting. You have daily resistance going on consistently on in areas where African-Americans are held as captives and, and running away in the Underground Railroad is an aspect of that resistance. Lisa, 30 second takeaway for us. Hope you're muted. I was lucky enough to talk to the grandson of Gabriel Timberlake, Fred Johnston, who lived to be 102 and just died um, in 2018. And um, his, his message to me was, do not forget my grandfather's story. Please continue to tell the story and to please tell people how important it was that the people, and he used the Quakers, um, that helped his grandfather escape. And the reason it was so important to him because of the, the message for today that so many people don't realize they can help people who are different from them and make a huge difference in their life, even if it is a little bit risky. So that's what I wanted to end with. <laughs> Trina? I wanted to end with, uh, again, like the importance of traveling for research to the side of where your family was enslaved or whoever, not, not your family, if it's not your historian or doing it for another project, but the subject that you're interested in, the people, because I mean, you will literally find things that you won't find otherwise, unless you go and the, you, don't, you know, and, and that does include costs. So like you can apply for grants. I know historians already know that, but you know, people, there are ways to make it happen. So you, it can be affordable for you to do it. Cause like, it's all about the time, you know, spending that time. So and Hillary, last thought, 30 seconds. Yeah, I, I, you've heard a lot from me tonight, so I don't need to say much more, but in adding to the whole connections theme that I had running through there, collaboration with this type of work is essential. These three people um, have helped me in unimaginable ways with my research, and we continue to collaborate and, and just grow that network if this is your interest, because the more you know, right? Um, so I'm looking forward to, to learning more about our, our connections with Michigan because there are so many and we've already started talking about how we're going to figure that out and make a project out of it. So thank you all. Happy Underground Railroad Month too.
That's right. Thank you all so much for, for being here this evening. Let me also take a minute to thank the folks behind the scene. Bridget Stryker has been really busy in the chat um, at, along with um, Sherry Giffen um, and uh, Toby Voigt uh, from the Michigan History Center and they support the work of the Michigan Freedom uh, Trail Commission. Let me also thank Roy Finkenbein who I know is, is with us this evening. He did a lot of the heavy lifting to put um, this series that we're gonna be enjoying throughout the month together, um, along with other people on the, the commission and in our partners uh, in Kentucky. Thank you all so much. Um, this has been really wonderful. And don't, don't forget to, uh, re to, to register to join us again um, in a week. September 16th is our next um, conversation, which will focus on uh, Cross White and uh, Robert Cromwell cases. My fellow commissioner, Roy Frankenbein, among others, will be participating in that. Um, thank you all again. Really terrific job. Look for our follow-up email with more information about how to continue your own research and thinking about these important topics. Good night. <laughs>